Welcome back. You're listening to the panel discussion, Information Sharing from Compliance to Defense, sponsored by Viasat on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your moderator, Jason Miller. Our guests today are Denise Anderson, the Executive Director of the National Health Information Sharing and Analysis Center, Karen Evans, the National Director of the U.S. Cyber Challenge, Brad Nix, the Deputy Director of the Homeland Security Department's U.S. CERT, Todd Radcliffe, the Section Chief of the Cyber Operations Division for the FBI, and Jerry Goodwin, the Chief Operating Officer of Government Systems Group of Viasat. Now, before break, Brad was just about to jump in on something that, that Jerry was saying when we talked about noise, we're talking about how to agencies kind of find uh, and companies find the right balance. So, Brad, lead us off. Well, I think that, that you know, talking about the noise, it sort of it strikes to the heart of the matter um, of, of, of threat, threat, you know, uh, understanding threat, understanding uh, threat information. Um, at, at US CERT, we are, um, we're not an ISP, but we, we do deal with data at, at a macro level. Um, we're looking at, um, or, or we're seeing data on a day-to-day -day basis across the federal government. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of different uh, customers, a lot of different, a lot of different clients, and, and, a, and a lot of, a lot of data um, that's, that, that, that we're looking, on, looking at. And I think that, you know, it was, it was understood pretty early on um, within our organization um, that, that you can't uh, instrument every um, bad signature out there and respond to it effectively. And I think that the same goes uh, for our enterprises. Um, you need to understand what it is that you're looking for. Um, you need to understand where your trust data is. You need to understand who your potential adversaries are. And you need to, you need to look for, for traffic that way, rather than just looking for things that um, might be part of the default vendor package. Um, and you know, the, the, the other part of that is uh, you know, just really, again, and it strikes back, or it comes back to sort of the risk discussion. Um, where is the risk within the organization? So I just wanted to, I wanted to sort of talk to that because there is a lot of noise, and this isn't, this isn't um, a new issue um, in, in information security and, and IT uh, security monitoring. This has been an issue ever since the first IDS hit the street. It, it's important for you to understand what it is that you're looking for. Brad, you mentioned the amount of data that U.S. CERT gets, and now you're, you guys are getting even more data because of the continuous diagnostics and mitigation program, and as the government-wide dashboard gets stood up, do you guys have some plans in place to kind of deal with that and all that noise that you can talk to, of course? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we do have plans. I think that one of the things that we're going through right now, actually, um, and I, I won't say that we're, I don't want to say we're just starting, it's something that we've been working on for quite some time, is understanding what what level of effort goes into um, processing all of the indicators that we're receiving. And, and we're doing it down to the unit level. Um, by, by doing that, it gives us a better understanding of, of what it takes from a resource perspective to actually do that processing. And this has all been um, a big part of uh, the working back and forth with Congress on the legislation um, to try to give them uh, a feel for and, and confidence in the fact that we can actually do this. Um, I think that with any, with any new endeavor, uh, there's always that sort of uh, clutching your seat and, 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 and waiting for the roller coaster to, to uh, leave the station uh, because you know that it's going to be interesting and there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of unexpected uh, experiences along the way. Uh, but with strong leadership, which you know we definitely have within the uh, within U.S. CERT as well as within NCIC, I think that we'll be pretty good uh, uh, weathering that, that that storm or, or riding that ride. Todd, do you guys at the FBI have the same challenge as DHS in terms of the, the the amount of information and then how to kind of pick out where the real threats are and then using some ana uh, analytics to to really process those threats and then share them with Denise or with with companies like like Viasat. I, I correct. Any that would be the intelligence side of what we do, the intelligence collection. Anytime you're collecting intelligence, you know it's always the two prong question. The first side is you've collected it. The second is can you actually analyze it, and what can you do with it? Because that's the situation you never want to be in to have something in your holding that could have helped somebody else. So that's always a concern. That's always something that um, that's why we have moved to a threat based model to where we prioritize our threats and then we can spend our resources and time on the highest level threats so that hopefully we will not be in that situation to where we're, we, we put our emphasis on and our resources towards surging and looking through those threats that we have collected on to ensuring that we get those on a structured uh, tiered, you know, tiered environment basically. But what do you do when you don't know what the threat is, right? You don't know what you don't know. Very famous line now, unfortunately. Correct. How do you deal with that from a cyber perspective? Well, from a cyber perspective, I think that's really where it, we look towards, as in any investigation, you know, as a street agent, I used to tell everyone, I don't know what's going on in your industry when I was working white collar crime or anything else. Someone has to tell me what's going on. I'm an FBI agent. I'm working the street. I'm not hanging out with the different people who are doing bad things. So that is where that relationship comes into 
with the community, with the industries, with other government agencies. You have to be able to tell us what is going on so that we can then know where to surge our resources. And that's a great segue to Denise. The trust relationship, the sharing, give me a sense from the ISAC perspective. Well, I, I wanted to mention, I think, um, you know, to um, Brad and um, Todd's point is that the ISACs have actually worked very closely with, with other agencies, such as um, the MKIC and with um, the U.S. Secret Service on doing some joint products. So we've actually been sharing information with each other and then coming up with mitigation strategies and putting out joint products on that. And then there was an ex actual specific example with the FBI where the don't know, don't, you, what you don't know um, scenario where the FBI was, and this is a couple years ago, was seeing a lot of activity where small municipalities and educational institutions were seeing their, their funds being taken out of their bank accounts. And they didn't understand necessarily the ACH network and how that works. So they called in some, some of the people within the FSISAC to come in and consult. And that's where we uncovered the whole account takeover attack um, scenario. So that was where it was a joint partnership coming together. We both didn't know it was going on. We did, but we didn't. And then we put the pieces together. So, But as far as your question with the trust community... Um, I, that's what ISACs are. We are basically communities of trust. And we share not only within our sectors, but we also share across our sectors. Um, I'm also chair of the National Council of ISACs, so I work very closely with all of the ISACs that are out there. And we have about 20 of them right now. And we also work with our government partners. So we're constantly bridging that. And it's been an education. Um, you know, we came on the NKIC floor in 2011 uh, when we got exposed to the intelligence community. Um, and that was, it's been, it's been an effort. And an education, but it's, you know, I'd like to say that today I think we're in a very different place than we were in 2011. So, Karen. Well, a a as you said, I have many different roles. So, in this one role as uh, director for the Center for Internet Security, the multi state ISAC is there. And when you start talking about the trust relationships, um, we're talking at a really high macro level right now, but a lot of this has to start at the grassroots type of down on the ground. And so, kudos to the FBI because as I travel around the country, and this is a lot of what everybody is afraid is going to get lost within the legislation, is there's a lot of local relationships that happen between the municipalities and the local FBI office. And so they don't necessarily realize what is happening, but they share information at that local level and they rely on the FBI local office to then tap into the bigger networks to get the information. And so that trust that the FBI has built at a local level, you want to make sure that it doesn't get lost as we start putting in some of these bigger apparatuses because the information it's got to come from the ground up and that's really you really do see a lot of that coming and and they're not necessarily going to see all the pieces but the FBI does have insight into that so Todd first of all we'll cut that later for you for Karen kudos to the FBI you can just put that on your ringtone go ahead <laughs> jump, jump in uh, I think two parts for that um, one is relationship you have to build relationship prior to an intrusion because when we go out to respond to an intrusion that's a roller coaster is the way I explain it for the victim. They're going through a roller coaster. If you don't have the relationship with your local field office, then the sharing, the trust will not be there when something happens. So our recommendation is come in. Come, we have 56 field offices, all have uh, cyber task forces with federal, state, local uh, individuals on there. We also have InfraGuard, which is our information sharing with the different communities in all those cities and locations, which also within the InfraGuard you will have, they call SIGs, uh, which will be special interest groups. So like in Houston, we had the oil and gas SIG. So all the oil and gas guys, we also had a healthcare one down there. So that's the mechanism we use to get different segments within individual AORs to know one another. Because uh, as Karen was saying, it doesn't all happen. It's outside the Beltway. We kind of think Beltway a lot here because that's what we see. But you have to remember it's how it happening outside of the Beltway already with the SIGs, the special interest groups. So that is a big part of what we do. And as I say, the, the most important thing is developing that relationship before. If you come into one of the 56 field offices as a corporation, develop that relationship, and we're already sharing information with you, then once things go bad, you will already know, hey, I need to call Todd Ratcliffe at Houston. We have a relationship. We see each other once a month, every couple of months. And then you already have that trust, and you're not as afraid to expose what's going on at your corporation when things are on fire. 
Jerry, talk a little bit about what react to what Todd said, the relationship piece. Yeah, actually, I I, I want to commend the FBI on this. I, I think that that they're doing a really good job in the field offices. I, I know that we, you know we've we've uh, got a relationship with them, and when incidents you know occur, you know that relationship is an ongoing relationship. When there's something serious, then there is a foundation of relationship there, and and so I, I think they are doing a good job with that. And and it, it is a level, it is a trust relationship that gets built up over a period of time. And so that you know, uh, you know the that you know you, you might not always get back necessarily answers because sometimes these things are difficult and you don't really have the answers. But I think what happens is there's a feeling of support. And I think that's so key the the feeling of support because mm -hmm. to create trust, it's it's not the technology ever, right, yeah. Karen? Well, and so I think that this is one of the dangers with the legislation that we were talking about earlier is, and depending on how DHS should roll out this responsibility, the idea that a portal would be established and that you're just going to deposit information into a portal and you're going to share all this information that is vulnerabilities or uh, log files or anything about your company and just dump it into a portal because legislation tells you to do it, I really think that how this is going to roll out and how how DHS goes about doing this, that they could maximize or leverage a lot of these local partnerships out there in order to build trust into a tool, because that's a tool that needs to be used across the board with everyone. Denise, you were, you were shaking your head in agreement. Well, and I was going to jump on, on your earlier comment where I, th I absolutely agree, um, and but I think it, and the word needs to be coordinated. We need to have coordinated information sharing versus all this, you know, just dump in a bucket type of environment because um, it can quickly become confusing. People won't know how to respond and it loses its efficiency because obviously in the cyber world, um, time is of essence. Brad. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the, the, the ink structure hadn't been stood up in 2009, I think that we would be in a really bad place right now with this. I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't even think it would have gotten off the ground. Um, and then the coordination piece of that, I think, is key. Um, that that having having a uh, a function in place that can coordinate cross ISACs, can coordinate with law enforcement, um, and make sure um, that that information is being provided. You know, from from my perspective, I want to make sure that the information that's coming in is as as cleansed as it possibly can be before it gets to us, because it's going to be our resources time that's going to take to actually do to do do a lot of that back end work if if it's not done when it comes to us. So it's important to us that. Um, that that is that 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 is managed, and you know the, the privacy and the civil liberties aspects of this is um, probably as big of a part of the conversation that we have on a day-to-day -day basis um, as as the actual functionality of, of, of you know and the actual capabilities, and, and as it should be. Um, so I, I you know I just want, I want to, and, and also I want you know want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, you know the local trust relationships. Um, you know we're not necessarily as, as a newer agency. You know although we do have uh, local presence, we. We're not at a point right now where we can necessarily scale uh, the way that that the FBI has scaled, um, and there is a lot of uh, a lot. You know, there's just a, a lot more time uh, to to have had that set up and, and having the field offices in place and everything. So, you know, for us, it's it, it's it's critical to to our, to our success that we maintain those relationships um, and that we are leveraging uh, those relationships in a way that we can uh, maintain established relation. We can maintain good relations with the the uh, the companies that are in, in those localities and, and are having issues as well. When we talk about trust, that also takes us down the path to where the information is. Is it a one-way information share? Is it a two-way information share? I know one of the things about uh, the, the legislation talks a lot about uh, liability protections to create that bi-directional sharing. But in many ways, Brad, the bi-directional sharing is already happening. Right. You guys aren't just pushing information out all the time. Right. And in the you know the 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 receiving of the of, of the information i think is the thing that we're really um we're really hoping uh this legislation imp improves substantially um i think that <clears throat> you've got a in, in in this world when you're when you're assessing threats and 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 you're using a lot of data to create you know to to help you establish information that you can use to protect yourselves um the, the more the more participation you can get in those programs the better and and if 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 we're just a um, if we're just sending stuff out, you know, it, that's just that's just our information. That's just the stuff that we're seeing, right. and you know, although we're within the national capital region, we're not we're not sitting. You know, we understand that there's a there's a bigger world out there, and and we want to see what's happening in that bigger world because we know that 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 will actually inform a lot a lot of decisions across the board. Karen, 
The liabilities issue is really very big, though, more for private industry. And, and I don't uh, – when you look at it from a government perspective, you're like, oh, yeah, we'll share the information and we'll look at this stuff. But the liabilities really comes back to, if, especially if you're a publicly traded company, that it comes back to the due diligence. Like I said I was doing these things. I said I was doing this risk assessment. I said I was doing this, and then my CEO signed off on it. And then I share the information, and then the logs or whatever comes up shows that maybe we weren't practicing it the best way that we could, similar to maybe like OPM. So I'll pick on OPM since, you know, that, that a lot of that happened and those plans were during our tenure, right? But um, what they're worried about is, is then I share it and then DHS sees a trend and maybe I wasn't necessarily practicing due diligence. What then becomes of that information sharing in that bi-directional? What then is the responsibility of DHS to share uh, what that company is doing in the ecosystem? Because if they're introducing vulnerabilities in a critical supply chain, yeah, that needs to be fixed. But now that company is going to be held accountable. That's really the liabilities issue that is happening there, and people are a little concerned about how that sharing is going to work. Jerry, we're going to take a quick break. When I come back, we're going to start off with you and, and maybe give a little bit of a reaction to that, because liability is a big issue for companies like yours who are looking at cyber and going, we see a problem, and then we have the false positives problem, or if it's real, if it's not real. So we'll take a quick break, come back, we'll jump back into that. You're listening to the panel discussion, Information Sharing from Compliance to Defense, sponsored by Viasat on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. <laughs> 